Good morning, Dr. Cantor. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our seventh annual Brain Health Series conversation at Howe Foundation. Um, we're very happy to have you here. And um, so how, how are you doing today? Good, thank you so much for having me yet again. Yeah, it's a pleasure, really. So let's just dive right in because I know people are interested to hear about your take on how to love your brain and um, brain health. And I have some questions for you. Um, first of all, let's start off about discussing your experience as a team physician for the rugby team and then your experience as a fight doc, as a ringside position. Um, so tell us about that and how it affected your thoughts on concussions and helping athletes take better care of their brains. Before I moved to South Florida near the Howe Foundation, I actually lived up in, in North Florida. And in North Florida, I was the, the team neurologist for the Jacksonville Sharks, so the arena football team, and also for the Axemen, the rugby team. Mm. Uh, at the same time, I was also licensed at that time always in, in uh, boxing and mixed martial arts. So as a ringside physician, not just a neurologist, but as a, a ringside physician here in the, the state of Florida. It may seem weird to you, a, a neurologist who deals with the brain and, and someone who focuses on concussion, why would they get involved with sports where people are getting knocked out or knocked down or having concussions? And, and the answer is a couple fold. One is these sports are gonna happen no matter what. So for us to bury our hands in the sand and just say, well, let that let somebody else deal with it, somebody who doesn't know as much about the brain deal with it, just doesn't seem like a right answer for me. My take in sports is if you're consenting adults, not children, consenting adults, making decisions, understanding fully, being fully informed that there are risks. And I believe there's a lot more information today than there was five years ago, and there certainly was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so if you make that decision, well, then you should be able to play the sport. I shouldn't be telling you what you can and can't do, but I should be there to help you get out of the sport if it's needed and not get back in until you're ready to get back in. Mm. And getting out of the sport and not getting back into the sport, this would be as a result of head injuries that you're seeing? The International Committees on, on Concussion, they meet every several years. And in, in one of them, it was used for a long time. It was called the, the Zurich Convention or the Zurich Committee. And, and basically what that said was when you have a concussion, there should be a low threshold for coming out of play and a high threshold for coming back into play. We still think that's the case, but there is some subtle nuances. It used to be that we always said it's the best idea to rest your brain completely, which makes some sense, but doesn't make other sense. When you think about a knee injury, if you have knee surgery or hip surgery, the surgeons are getting you up with a physical therapist that same day and doing physical therapy. Yet with the brain, we say, well, let's let it rest. The other issue with that is, it was never that practical. It's hard to tell anybody, but especially a 16-year-old who's addicted to their cellular phone, to their smartphone, tell them to rest their brain and not use social media and not use that. So what we think is that the less of that blue light is, is better, the less of using that brain for that sort of thing is better. But we're starting to learn more about how we can healthily get people back into using their brains and try to get them back to functioning better, faster. A lot of times in sports, we focus on return to play. Those of us who are interested in youth athletes think about return to school as well. Athletes, when they're kids, the, their only responsibility isn't just a sport. It's obviously being part of the school and getting them back in in a way that's safe for them is something that's a high priority for us. Mm. Yes. Um both the, the school and the sports. Um, we're talking about speaking about that and young people. Tell us about your experience with the Florida State High School Athletic uh, Committee, the 
Um, you're the chair of their concussion subcommittee for sports medicine. Do I have that right? Yeah. So several years ago, almost a decade ago, there was discussions in the Florida state legislature about making some sort of law that would bring youth athletes out and not let them back in until they've been seen by, at the time there was debate, should it be an allopathic or osteopathic doctor, so MD or DO, the regular kind of doctor you go to, or should other types of professionals be allowed to do it? Neuropsychologists are highly educated, but they're educated about perhaps the cognition and how you think, not necessarily about how you move. And we know concussions don't just affect one aspect of your brain, they can affect lots of aspects. So that law that was brought to to vote on that on that bill, it was taken out actually of the legislature and it was brought back the next year. But in the meantime, the Florida High School Athletic Association said, we see the writing on the wall. We're going to need a sports medicine advisory committee. And so they established a sports medicine advisory committee. And then I was made chair of that subcommittee to the sports medicine advisory committee. And the subcommittee was really to look at this idea of concussion. And what we have to look at is Florida is a large state. And you can think of it as a microcosm of the United States in general. People thought at one time, well, maybe we should make the rule that everyone should see a neurologist. Then they realized there aren't enough neurologists. There aren't enough doctors who deal with brain injury in the country or in the state. Mm -hmm. Also, if you talk about the West Coast of Florida or uh, higher up, if you talk about uh, North Florida to the Panhandle, there may not be a physician for many, many miles. Forget about a physician who specializes in, in brain injury. And so we wanted to make it practical and we had to make the same rules for everyone throughout the state. And what we did is we said, you have to have a low threshold to come out and then a high threshold to come back into play. And that's what we've tried to do with youth athletes. I'm proud to say that Florida has probably has the best rules, I love to say. And we are now in all 50 states that have rules about it. We're actually on that next iteration. People are saying, well, what other rules should we have? Should we have things, for example, to educate people about something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE? Some people have seen the movie Concussion or heard about it in the news, especially when the tragedy happens, like a retired NFL player, has some sort of suicidal or homicidal ideation and actually does something. And then on brain autopsy, so at the end of life, they're found to have these things called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And what that is, is that saying that over time, not just one attack, not just one hit to the head, but even these like hits that go on and on and on, like you think happens in sports, can lead to a pathological finding after life called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Mm. Where we are now this year is that people are thinking, well, how can we diagnose that when people are still alive? Not just make it a post-mortem after death diagnosis. How can we actually make that diagnosis and how can we prevent that? We want to prevent it in everyone, but we want to pre especially prevent it in our youth athletes. Right. That would be great to be able to identify it ahead of time, because even this this year recently, I've seen you know, an, um, a few articles about even um, youth athletes where they found CTE in their brains um, afterwards. And, um, you know, it'd be great to be able to identify um, identify ahead of time if there's any, any kinds of issues like that. Um, yeah. We need to identify who has it, but we also need to identify what protects you against it. Yeah. It, it seems clear that there are some people who are more prone to concussion versus other people. Also, remember that once you have one concussion, you're prone to more injuries, not just another concussion. If you have a concussion, you might have a response that's a little bit slower, a microsecond slower. And then what will happen is you'll have a knee injury because you just don't have that competitive advantage at the time if you're still suffering from the effects of the concussion. And people forget that a lot of times. They think, well, I don't see a cast on it. When someone has a, a knee injury or they broke an arm, you see a cast. It's very visible to everyone. When someone gets hit in the head, a lot of times people say, well, you look fine. I don't see anything around you. I don't see anything going on.
but actually there's something deeper going on inside. And we know there's biochemical changes happening. And those biochemical changes take even longer to repair with the younger you are. Mm -hmm. So for kids who are not in high school, but are in elementary or middle school, it probably takes at least a month for the biochemistry of their brain to return back to normal. Yet our recommendations are always about returning as quickly as possible because there's so much pressure, not just by the schools and not by the coaches and not by the other athletes. There's also self-pressure. Remember, people who are involved in sports are, are very motivated to play that sport. A lot of times parents get a little over-enthusiastic with their children. They forget that less than 1% of people ever become professional athletes. So although your Jimmy may seem really good at uh, youth football, it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be in the NCAA or certainly not in the NFL. And the question is, is it worth it to put that child at risk now when for sure you know they need their brain later on? You don't right. know if they need their brain mm -hmm. to play a sport because yeah. you don't know if it's going to be just like a weekend warrior, just somebody who plays sports on the weekends or doesn't play at all versus somebody who plays all the time. Right. Or Sally for, with the um, soccer team, the women's soccer team in the future. Same thing, right? I mean, football attracts concussions, but it's not the only sport. Soccer and wrestling and um, hockey, other sports too. Am I correct? American football by far is not the only sport. It's just probably the most visible because for good or, or bad, for better or for worse, NFL and, and football has become America's pastime. We think about movies like, uh, you know, we think about uh, any given Sunday. We think about the lights. Uh, we think about what goes on, especially in small town America, where the high school football team may be the largest attraction that weekend. Yeah. Brings Other families together. To it, and, and we see it actually more. We see concussion more actually in women's field hockey than we see it in football. It's just that not that many people are familiar with women's mm. field hockey as soccer. So football in the rest of the world becomes more and more popular in the United States. And as a father of a soon to be nine year old girl, I know how popular soccer can be in our, in our community. There's lots of ways that soccer can lead to concussion. You have impacts of, of child against child. You have impacts of uh, a foot to the head. You have impacts of a knee to a head, of a head to a head of headers, which should never be allowed in children. I'm not quite sure if they should be allowed in adults, but they are, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly not in children. There's not a good reason. It doesn't make you a better player to suffer from long-term mm -hmm. side effects of being hit in the head. When you say children, are you talking about um, kids in say grammar school and middle school um, before they get to high school and is that because that their brains are more um, physiologically or or physically vulnerable at that age or people people in regular society know that the human brain takes a while to fully form people are born obviously with brains are doing things but it takes time for us to start walking for us to start talking there's still that myelination so that white matter covering that makes the brain more efficient there's still that going on until someone's in their mid 20s that's why we probably wait till someone is 18 to serve in the military. We vote, wait for them to be 21 to drink alcohol. There are, are things that we do. We wait because we know that someone's brain is just not fully there. And anyone who's a, a parent of, of high schoolers know in a lot of ways they can look like adults, but they might not be fully functioning in terms of the, the full capacity. And so you don't want a time when someone is still forming these connections, these synapses uh, between the different nerves, the neurons, you don't want that to be a time when someone gets hit in the head. So when we talk about youth athletes, we're talking about youth, not just high school. We're also talking about elementary and middle school. There's a lot of focus on high school sports because high school is really the gateway to college sports, which is definitely the gateway to professional sports. And so there's a, a lot of focus, obviously, on that. One of the frustrations I've had is we made amazing laws and rules to protect high school athletes. But my question has been, what do we do about that elementary school kid or that middle school kid? Where arguably it's even less important that they're uh, really good at sports. And it's more important that they're learning the basics of arithmetic and basics of reading. Right. 
Um, exactly. So um, that's very helpful. And let me ask you, um, speaking about um, student athletes. So as the uh, chair of Health Foundation's uh, Concussed Student Athlete Medical Advisory Committee, um, what are some of the some of the things that you've enjoyed uh, the most over the past almost three years of serving in this capacity? And is there anything you've learned um, that surprised you um, through your uh, work with us? Well, what's interesting and what's great about the Howe Foundation is this attitude of not just waiting. This idea, someone has a concussion, and now you just wait for them to get better. They either get better or they don't. There's nothing you can do about it. We now think that there's more and more you can do. I talked earlier about how we're having different conversations about how fast you should get into mental activity versus not. There's also other things you can do. There's no medications that are FDA approved for this. Uh, there's no blood tests yet that can definitively say whether someone has a concussion or not. But right now... There's a treatment that's been around for over 100 years that many people are using to help improve their symptoms after a concussion, and that's hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen, the idea of a, of a medical-grade hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that a person is put inside a tube, and not all those tubes have to be, have to be dark in color. They can actually be glass, so it can help people who have perhaps claustrophobia and the idea is that the oxygen is put under pressure. So not only do you have a higher concentration of oxygen, instead of 21%, which we're all breathing, you have 100% of oxygen, but also it's compressed, just like when you're diving down deeper. And people may know about hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, more when it deals with people who are coming up from the bends, people from scuba diving where we're actually doing the reverse of what we're talking about. You're actually trying to slowly bring a person back up to normal atmosphere as opposed to being pressed down. In somebody with a concussion, what we try to do is we try to put them into this, uh, into this therapy. First, their ears are checked and make sure that there's not a contraindication or a reason they can't have it done. And they go under the pressure slowly until they get to in most places, we think of it as at least two atmospheres uh, of pressure. And, and so what that means is that by compressing that oxygen, we think it's getting closer and closer to where it needs to get, which is actually the nerve cells. So getting into the cells and, and, and helping it. We do know about hyperbaric oxygen for other things, such as wound healing. Mm -hmm. And there we think it's very important when someone has a wound for oxygen to get into the right locations and to really press inside there. And that's why hyperbaric oxygen has, has frankly been so successful for people who have wounds, especially wounds that are not a healing properly. So wounds that are hard to treat. Most people, you can treat their wound, you treat them with antibiotic, they're okay. But some people, there's still problems. They may have diabetes also, and that makes it harder to heal. And so you want to get that oxygen closer to where it needs to be. Well, the same thing is probably true for the brain. I use words like probably because my attitude towards modern medicine is that until we have conclusions that can be definitively said, and I, even once we do, I think it's arrogant for us in medicine to think we ever fully understand the amazing thing that is the human body. But until we get to that point, I, I think we're still using hypotheses. We're still saying what we think happens and how we think it works. Eventually, I think what we'll find is that hyperbaric oxygen works in most people who have concussions and certainly people who wanna get rid of their concussion symptoms faster rather than, than slower. And then we're gonna have a question actually about why are there some people who don't respond to it? As opposed to the question now we have, well, how does it work? We're gonna have questions later. We're gonna say, well, this person had a concussion why isn't it working on everyone? Because no treatment works on everyone. And I think those will be the future questions. So not even the questions of whether it works or not, we'll assume that it works because of study after study. So what are these studies now? Well, it, it's difficult, but not impossible. It's difficult to do well-controlled clinical studies of hyperbaric oxygen. What I mean by that is if we're testing a new drug, a pill, well, we give you either the real drug or a drug that looks exactly like it, but is we call it a sugar pill. It's not really sugar. But placebo. We call it a placebo. 
Mm. And so the question is, what is that sham treatment or that placebo in hyperbaric oxygen? I think I have an idea. To me, it makes sense. You put the person in the tube, so they think they're going into the tube. And then what happens is you're going to have to reduce their pressure. You're going to have to increase the pressure they're going under. And so they feel a little yeah, bit of that ear popping, but then bring them back up. So for the bulk of time, when they're there for the hour, hour and a half, they're actually just at normal pressure and normal oxygen uh, percentage as well. So mm. the person will be blinded. The person who is examining them, the examiner, the doctor will be blinded. And when we say blinded, we mean you don't know what allocation a person is. Are they getting a real, mm. are they getting sham or placebo? The uh -huh. only people that will know what's happening and, and they shouldn't tell it to anybody is actually the technician. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, you need the technician not knowing uh, what's going on. So the technician will know if a person is being treated or not, but then they won't talk to any of the study team. Right now, what we're trying to do, uh, before we get to the idea of a, a large clinical trial that, that can look at that, and, and part of that becomes funding, uh, part of that becomes uh, the question of, is there uh, a company behind it that wants to push it forward? We know that drug trials cost tens of millions uh, to hundreds of millions of dollars. And you can imagine the hyperbaric oxygen also, that, that would be a very expensive trial to conduct. They don't have necessarily have to be as long as the trials we may have for Alzheimer's, dementia, or for Parkinson's, or for multiple sclerosis, or even for diabetes, really, because we're really just trying to get the person out of that uh, out of that concussion that they're having. So we could have shorter trials because one of the things that's amazed me actually at the Howe Foundation is to hear these stories of people who have gone for just a few treatments. We're not talking about going for 20 to 40 treatments. These people have gone for a handful of treatments and yet they're already seeing that the symptoms get better. Mm -hmm. And to say, well, they were only going to get better anyway, well, then why didn't they get better yesterday or the day before or the day before? Right. Obviously calling the hyperbaric oxygen chamber area because they're not getting better. The families mm -hmm. are calling because the person isn't getting better. And the fact that they suddenly get better after the treatment, to me, seems like more than coincidence. Yeah. So what I've asked, what I've asked you and, and some of our volunteers at Half Foundation to do is to collect as much of that information that we're anyway collecting. So information about someone's cognition, so about how someone thinks. I hope in the mm -hmm. future we collect more about people's actual neurological examinations as well. And to see well, what happens beforehand versus what happens afterwards. And then we can analyze the data and we can keep ourselves as analyzers mm -hmm. blind to the idea of whether someone got treated or not. We don't know when I'm analyzing numbers if that person's been treated or if they haven't been treated. And then we can come to some conclusions. That's not as good, obviously, from a quality of evidence point of view as a randomized, controlled, double-blinded clinical trial, but it's using the resources we already have. It's mm -hmm. using the people who have already gone through that to learn more about also how to design these sorts of trials in the future. Right, and we have been sending you the um, CNSVS uh, neurocognitive computer-based testing that we do before and after the hyperbaric treatments. Um, that's you know very very uh, um, interesting, and yeah, it'll be great to see you know what what you come up with when we have a substantial enough body of, of data, and and the ones that from our experience um, that have um, gotten better with just a few sessions happen to be the ones that have had a concussion um, less than a week or two weeks out before you know, the brain uh, before the, the chemicals in the brain that are released by concussion have had a chance to do any damage, if that's the correct way to, to, produce, to uh I think it makes a lot of sense. In, in mm -hmm. almost any diagnosis in medicine, the earlier you treat, the better. We're mm -hmm. showing that time and time again, with almost any treatment we have for any kind of medical problem, the earlier you treat, is usually the better. You catch cancer earlier, that's better than catching it later. You catch diabetes earlier, that's better than catching it later. Mm -hmm. you catch Alzheimer's dementia earlier, it's better than catching it later. So it's not surprising to me that mm -hmm. it's going to be. And that's where I talked a little bit about this idea that there might be new diagnostic tools that we use. Because right now, concussion is still a clinical diagnosis, which means somebody who understands what's going on in the brain looks at that person, looks at the biomechanical forces that happened, like what was the injury and said, well, 
it doesn't seem like a concussion happened. Sometimes it's clear. Sometimes we can be watching NFL, and, and many of us may have seen uh, some sports games where the player stood up and then kind of wobbled back down, and it was clear it wasn't a knee problem or wasn't a leg problem. The person was still dazed. They yeah. still had their build on. That is a concussion. Right. That person should be taken out of play, and that person should not be back allowed back into play until they've recovered. Unfortunately, so many millions of people are watching mm-hmm. – uh, these shows and watching these NFL games that people start to notice things that happen where they probably should have been taken out of play in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> we talked about, you know, helping student athletes uh, to love their brains. And, and we're, we've talked about hyperbaric oxygen therapy and some, and, you know, we're talking about uh, your mention of the professional athletes where, you know, even an untrained eye can see that there's something wrong with their brain. Um, How can you say anything, something about how you see, since our theme is love your brain, um, how you see medical grade hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a way for our concussed student athletes and their families to um, love their brain and achieve good brain health, um, you know, can you say anything about that? And especially starting at, you know, early, early ages where they can learn more about their brain concussion education and learn that there is a treatment and kind of get them on the right foot so that if they have, you know, more concussions in high school and college, um, that might, you know, make their uh, trajectory, um, brain health trajectory safer and healthier. Well, uh, that's important because as opposed to a treatment for a medical problem that you have that you may see commercials on TV about, there's no commercials on, on TV about hyperbaric oxygen. So it's important for people to know that there is a treatment that's available. That treatment through the Howe Foundation can become affordable or even free for some people who have concussion. So I would say if you have a concussion, if you're a student athlete, certainly if you're a military veteran, if you're equestrian, I think you should contact the Howe Foundation, see if there is anything possible, either from the Howe Foundation or perhaps there's other foundations or, or nonprofits that, that can help out as well. You know that you're not in this journey alone. You're not, it, it can feel very alone. And actually having a concussion can make you feel more socially isolated. Mm-hmm. It can make you feel like you're more alone, but you're not alone. There's a lot of people this is important to, and we want you to get better. And so... Until we know more definitively who does and doesn't have a concussion, until we have a biomarker that tells us, well, this person, no matter what you do, is going to get great. This person, no matter what you do, is never going to work. And then there's going to be most people where if you don't do something, the person's not going to be back to fully normal. You may not notice that, but using things like we talked about, like using these computerized neuropsychological tests, so CNS vital signs we're using, for example, in the Howe Foundation, can we find more subtle uh, things about how your brain is not working well, and that can maybe be captured and can alarm someone that they should go ahead and intervene in that mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I would say right now, you know, if my eight-year-old had a concussion, would I wait a year to put on hyperbaric oxygen? No. Would I wait a month? No. Would I wait a week? Probably not even. Uh, We're lucky enough, we live in the United States, right? So there's hyperbaric oxygen chambers all over. Mm -hmm. And and I would probably want to get her in uh, sooner rather than later. Would I do it that exact same day? Well, probably in retrospect, if she needed it, I'll kick myself for not doing that. But as a practical point of view, will I be able to get her in that day? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it will probably be something, even as a, a neurologist who deals with this, that takes a little bit of time. Take appointments, to, yeah. To, Medical to records. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, Dr. Kanner. And um, thank you so much for being here with us today and for your generous um you know, work with us and and your time and um, your expertise. We so appreciate it and look forward to so much more in the future. We're very excited um, to have you and the other physicians on our team and um, about what we're doing. And um, yeah, we we have our, we have our brains for the rest of our life. So we might as well love them and take good care of them. Thank you so much for having me and raising awareness to this important topic. My pleasure.